Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a privilege and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. Has anyone ever asked you why you are a Seventh-day Adventist? A young couple that had been recently baptized called me a few years ago and said that uh, their former pastor of a Protestant church and their members, which they had become very, very acquainted with, participated in a lot of activities, were giving them a hard time. They were calling them and telling them that they were going to be lost that they did not know what they were talking about or the decisions that they made by becoming Seventh-day Adventists. And they reached the point where they said, we need help. We're a little shaky. We're new as Adventists. We need to know from Scripture how to respond to these well-meaning, but we believe, misinformed Christians. They said that their pastor had challenged them to explain to their friends and the chapter and the pastor why they had chosen to be baptized into the Seventh day Adventist Church. And so they asked me, would you help us? And I said, uh, why don't you contact your local pastor? church that you're going to and ask him to help you. And they said, we did. And he said, I don't feel comfortable going face to face with another pastor and uh, the poor spirit, the antagonistic spirit that would exist. I suggest that you call Chuck the Bible. So I got the call. I just related to you. And I suggested uh, to this young couple that uh, I would be happy to meet with them. And I encouraged that not, not only for the pastor to be there, but they, that he would invite all of their members. Because he wanted to have a debate on the Sabbath. Well, I believe that the Word of God is the inspired thoughts of God, and that God cannot bless me or anyone if we start debating his word. That's right. So, I suggested that they call their former pastor and said, I would be glad to meet with them and that I would like for him to invite anyone that he chose. So that day was set up and I showed up. And uh, people started asking me questions. And so I said, I have a suggestion. I have a request. I would like for you to share with me why you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. And then I will share with you why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. When my turn came, I said, the reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I'm convinced that God is looking for a people to be alive when Jesus comes. And the pastor said, are you telling me that's where you're an Adventist? And I said, yeah. There are members of the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church that worship on Saturday. Saturday is irrelevant if you don't understand why we go to church, period. Total silence. So I shared with them a scripture that I'm going to read to you later on in 1 Thessalonians. The pastor had defended his position about going to church on Sunday from Acts chapter 14. So I addressed that and I said to him, but you're quoting the fourth commandment. No, I'm not. Then he quoted 
Revelation 14. And I said, that's speaking of the fourth commandment. And I read it to him, word for word. Then I took him back, left to the Old Testament and Genesis chapter 20, verses 8 to 13. Exodus. Exodus. Thank you. And he said, I do not have a response to you. And I said, that's okay. I didn't write any of this. You need to respond to God and be able to pick God on this issue. I'm going to share with you this morning why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and why I chose the title that I did for my remarks this morning. Do you want to be translated? The word translated means people that are alive when Jesus comes and he takes them up to heaven without never having seen death on this earth. Or do you prefer to be resurrected? The point here is an attitude. What is your attitude? What is your motivation to live your Christian life? I believe that if we understand a very important word in the Bible, our motivation will be mentally, attitude-wise, to prepare ourselves to be alive when Jesus comes. Because 1 Thessalonians 4 must be fulfilled. There's going to be no resurrection until there's a people that make it possible for Jesus to come and they're alive when He comes. I already said that the Bible is the inspired thoughts of God recorded for our understanding. If we study the Bible, if we have been instructed to study the Bible. And when we do, then we have the guarantee that the Holy Spirit will give us all understanding in God's Word. I suggest that you look up three scriptures regarding the understanding that God guarantees He will give us if we study His Word as He has instructed us to. The first scripture is John 14, 26. The next one is John 16, 13. And the next one is 2 Timothy 2, 7. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, we are told that God created the human race in His image and in His likeness. The word image means we were created internally with the ability to see and process through our minds what we see and to process what we hear, process what we taste, process what we touch. That is the ability to process information. That's what the word image means. And so God is saying to us, and when I say God, I'm speaking here of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, created us in His image so that we can process information and make choices. We're also told that we were created in His what? Likeness. That means that we were structurally created similar to the three members of the Godhead. At the end of chapter 1 of Genesis, the last verse, 31, we learn that God surveyed everything that He had created and He decided that it wasn't good, but very good. Adam and Eve, however, disagreed. They decided that what God created was not very good, it was not even enough. They needed and wanted more. And so, Eve allowed herself to be deceived by the serpent because the serpent convinced her, Eve, you will never be fulfilled totally as a human being or as a woman until you know as much as God does. That means you need to know about evil. Evil is an interesting word. Because if you add the letter D to evil, what do you get? And the devil is the source of all evil. Which means sin. Now we're using the word sin here as a noun. The sin problem that Adam and Eve 
introduced to this world that God said was very good before they made that choice. By choosing to know evil, Adam and Eve changed everything that God had made into bad, wrong, and crooked. So what did God do? Did God decide, I'm going to wipe these two out and start over again with Adam and Eve number two? The scripture says that God decided to win the hearts of Adam and Eve, number one. And God began this process of winning their hearts by introducing them to a very, very important word which meant something very, very crucial for them. In Genesis 3.15, Jesus, the Creator, says to Satan, Eve, and Adam, I'm going to P-U-T, put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. And yes, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. God said that to them because now that Satan had convinced them to sin against God, they were no longer able in their own strength to resist Satan naturally. So God put, implanted, enmity, otherwise known as grace. Grace made it possible for Adam and Eve to develop a hatred for sin. If you're interested, that thought comes from Desire of Ages, page 407. Sin is horrible. Sin has alienated us and separated us from God. In the English language, you can look it up for yourself in Webster's Dictionary, the word alienation means mentally deranged. The biblical meaning of the word alienation means spiritual insanity. The evidence of that is that God created Adam and Eve in His image and in His likeness. But now that they have chosen to disobey God and sin, Paul describes in Romans 5, 6 that they became helpless and ungodly. What a sad picture of a human race that was created in God's image and likeness. In verse 8, he says, they also became sinners. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. The word enmity means it's against God. It's resist God. It's at war with God. What do people do when they go to war against each other? They kill each other. And that is exactly what we did to Jesus when he came to this earth. Enmity. What else? Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And it is not capable of submitting to God. What is the opposite of submitting? Subordinating. That's all that God has ever asked us to do since Adam and Eve sinned. Will you be willing to subordinate, submit your will to me, and I will reproduce my character in you? What an incredible promise. And even if we try, the last part of Romans 8, 7, we're not able to. That's the way I wake up every morning. Every morning that I wake up, including Sabbath, what I naturally want to do is either bad or illegal, and I'm not trying to amuse you. And unless I connect 
to that enmity, that grace that Christ gave us and that he told Adam and Eve and Satan, I will naturally yield to everything that is bad and illegal during the waking hours of every day. The only biblical solution to this situation is a word, justification. Now the word justification in the New Testament has nine different usages. Those nine different usages fall under three main categories. Justification in general means turning something that is crooked straight, something that is bad good, something that is wrong right. Right. R-I-G-H-T. It's an important word for us in the English language because the English language of 1611, which was the language used to write King James Version, talks about righteousness. Nest. In the Greek language, the word for the, or the root word for what is just is dikaiu. And then you get the nine different meanings or usages as you add suffixes to dikaiu. Like righteousness. And other illustrations. Justification means that now Adam and Eve have been made right again. Justification, therefore, is the opposite of sin. <coughs> Justification reverses the evil that sin has caused. Amen. It bridges the chasm that separates the human race from the throne of God. This bridging is what the Bible writers call at one meant. We pronounce it what? Atonement. The atonement means we have been reconciled to God. Very, very, very important word. Re justification reconciled us to God, including Adam and Eve, after their creation. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we learn that this enmity against God has now been bridged and thereby reconciling us to God. Which means that the human race after the cross stands as Adam and Eve did before God, justified. Praise Him. Praising God. <coughs> in Romans, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, Paul uses the same expression. He goes into more detail in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, when he speaks of the word reconciliation. Biblically, it means we now stand before God in divine favor. The only difference between us now and Adam and Eve when God created them in His image and likeness is that we are indwelt with a sinful nature. And the solution to that issue is what we're going to study this morning. And that is why the Bible writers call Jesus the Savior of the world. You should look it up. John 4.42 and 1 John 4.14. Justification describes the miracle of the ages with the help of the cross. It required the creator of the universe to give up his very life, a total sacrifice known as the second death. The second death. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, this morning in Sabbath school, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 9, here, right now, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, when you get there, say, ready, and I'll read <coughs> 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, specifically Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The word death appears twice here. And it's speaking of a specific usage of the word death. It's speaking of the second death. The word used there in Greek is thanatos. And if you have uh, young, uh, Strong's Analytical Concordance, I'll give you the number so you can look it up for yourself. It's number 2288. The definition from the second death is what? No resurrection. You died, you're dead, you've been killed, that's it. That's the way the word death is being used in Hebrews 2, verse 9. It is crucial that we understand that when we read the word death, we need to understand what kind of death it is. The Greek word for the first death is anastasis. And again, if you have stones, it's 386. You know what it means? <coughs> Standing up again, literally. You may have died and they laid you horizontally, but if you die the second death, if you die in Jesus, you're going to stand up again. Hallelujah. That's what that word death means. And that is why Jesus prayed the way that he did in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Turn to the right to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. We're not talking about the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 6. We're talking about the way Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father when he was here. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. You there? In the days of his flesh. Some people say, well, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he took upon himself all the bad stuff. True. He took all of the sins of the world upon himself. But in order to save me and you, he ethically and legally had to take on my nature at the incarnation, or he couldn't have ethically and legally saved me. And so the word here in the days, plural, from his birth, of his what? Flesh. The word flesh is being used as the nature, my nature, that he took on at the incarnation. In the days of his flesh, he offered both prayers and supplications. How? With loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from what? Death. The word death there is the second death. And he was heard... Some translations say because of his piety, some because of his sincerity, some because of his reverence. That is how Jesus prayed, prayed, prayed. In studying this topic with people through the years, I have heard remarks like, well, that's not really accurate, Sean, because Jesus himself predicted several times that he would be resurrected. But God wants for us to not have just a superficial understanding of Scripture. At Gethsemane, something happened that he had never experienced before. Ever. It was such an experience that he sweat drops of water. <laughs> Jesus had no problem experiencing the first death. From the first death, there's a resurrection. Wonderful. If I'm not alive when Jesus comes, I'm looking forward to the resurrection. But my attitude, my mindset, is to be alive when Jesus comes. That's what we're talking about this morning. Our motivation. A careful study of Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A careful study of the word forsaken clarifies any doubt as to, about, as to what Jesus was experiencing on the cross. That God had indeed, and here's the definition in Greek, 
of the word forsaken. Deserted and permanently abandoned. Look it up. I have Strong's reference. The number of that for that word for a second is number one four five nine. I won't even try to pronounce the word. A very perceptive thinker wrote that Christ could not see beyond the portals of the tomb as he hung the cross. Desire of Ages, page seven fifty three. Even after his resurrection. And Mary is hanging on to him, clinging to him. Jesus says to her in John 20, 17, Mary, stop clinging on to me. I have not yet ascended to my heavenly Father. I have not received the official approval that my mission to justify the human race is acceptable to him. Folks, I'm paraphrasing scripture here. That is the mindset that Jesus had. Why is it so important for each of us to understand and appreciate the full meaning of the word justification in these last days? An understanding that John Calvin, Martin Luther, the Wesley brothers, and all the reforms did not have. Why is it so important? Did God use them? Yes. But all that they could understand about the word justification was in reference to the period of time in which they were living in. They were living in the time before the end of time. They were living in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. <coughs> What does Daniel 12, verse 4 say? In the last days there will be an increase of what? No. Knowledge. So the work that God gave these reformers was to prepare people to die and then come up in the first resurrection. That was their job. And they did a wonderful job. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. When you're there, stay ready and I'll read. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Are we ready? For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 17. Then we, who are what? Alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So clearly, there will be a people alive when Jesus comes. In fact, Jesus cannot come back until someone has made themselves ready. Amen. These reformers were very faithful to the knowledge and understanding that they had about the word justification in their day. But they lived in the historical biblical time, which all of you are familiar with, the 1260 year period which began in 538 A.D. and concluded in 1798 A.D. That is the only possible understanding that these dear reformers could have. We, however, are living in the cosmic antitypical day of atonement. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and all of heaven are preparing 